those. Yeah, right. Um, you know what's so funny, Joe? I figured my whole career was just going to be in a dark, glowing room at Sony for the rest of my life. Like <laughs> after after I came out of Silicon Studios and SGI, I was like, oh, oh wow. okay, I know my path. That's it. That's all it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, is there anything else? Can I do anything else? Can I actually be upward and mobile? Can we yeah. stand up and have a workstation? <laughs> Right. And then, yeah, there was oh, a possibility man. of a stand-up station. Like, no, not at all. I mean, that was yeah. when caught cots under the table, right? Yes. Like hundred percent. hundred percent. Hey, anything to ship it was the the whole ethos that we had. You know, if it had took a hundred hours a week, it took a hundred hours a week. Yeah, totally. Totally. I got stuff I, done. That work <laughs> ethic. That work ethic. That is a that is scarce <laughs> yeah well you know we're dealing with some fallout these days it's, yeah. it's a little different but no uh, it, 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 there is we got the um, the amazing things that happen in those kind of like boiler room yeah uh situations you know especially when you've got like a, a bunch of of new technology and new people and yeah. new ideas in one space and you kind of like don't go home for a while yeah. and then it's that two o'clock in the morning idea with a team that you were like no way yes that winds up making everything yeah. work i i have to thank dreamworks interactive because that was where the magic was for me so it was you know employee 40 back then and it was just like oh my god it was a golden parachute in retrospect and at the time you know it was just be creative there's no mm -hmm. PL. There's no PL. Just be creative. <laughs> right. <laughs> what? What? I chased my whole career for that moment again. <laughs> yeah, right. I was in uh, early days of MMOs, and that was yeah. on, on that side. And we were I was drafted out of the uh, pen and paper ranks. So like started okay. off in like the more of a Dungeons and Jaggy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Sort oh, of course. side. Yeah. Because we were interactive narrative. And if yep. you if you could write interactive narrative and grew up with understanding if then statements you yeah. know you were a superpower in a in yeah. an engine in anything that could could do that's, a branching story architecture that's funny you say that the um i was part of digital planet before dreamworks so uh josh greer digital planet we did we were network-based content developers nobody said the web and yeah. uh, um we did madeline's mind which madeline's mind was the oh. first episodic web adventure like the venice house that people were doing blogging at the time i mean it's so old school uh, it's hard to even talk about we're talking right about well it's like I, yeah every <laughs> time i talk i have these conversations it feels like now though right like all yes. of these people are like what's the metaverse what's the metaverse it yeah. just feels like what's the internet oh 100 again, right? 100%. like how do i make a, a metaverse thing as yes. like how do i make a web page is the, yes. the same culture over and over again yes and, we, we might be giving the same talk right now <laughs> we'll see now I, i'm i'm gonna dive into a little bit of what we experimented in last week i had at last year i had a really big opportunity since um, we were stuck in the middle of a pivot and yeah. I was stuck in the middle of like seriously five days between when I was supposed to move and when the lockdown came down. Oh my God. Um, yeah. So I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. what do you do? Right? Yes. Totally. Um, but I'll, I'm going to spend some time on like how we adapted and like how yeah. these how this stuff allowed us to, to bring a community to adapt. So uh, I got to step away from everything from a little bit and do real organic growth for probably only the second time in my life so wow. it's really exciting to see yeah totally i i have a little bit of a different uh interesting perspective bringing something back from three years ago that's relevant mm. and so i'm like wow you know i'm so used to dropping and then moving on i'm like oh wait i actually should go back and be like oh it's kind of relevant right now Right. Yeah, three right. years later. <laughs> all that stuff we were talking about we're still talking about and now yes. it has words that people yes. understand yes. like 60 so, minutes is talking all right yeah. cool i could talk yeah. to my mom now yeah 100 percent. 100 percent. all right well i think with that we should just get started right um yeah, yeah. so um <laughs> great little lead way there so uh yeah so this is the special interest group from aila uh, we host this on the last Monday of every month on a different topic, um, and we decide on the topic by from the previous meeting. So the last meeting, we were talking about human-robotic interaction, robot mm -hmm. interaction, and um, at the very end, we were talking about, you know, character development and, like, what the metaverse is and, like, how AI play a role there. And so here we are now with uh, Joe Unger and Kathleen Cohen 
two of my friends and uh, been coming out to AILA stuff for a while. And um, I'm happy that we got to bring you two together um, on this special uh, virtual special interest group uh, speaking on AI in the metaverse. And so um, I think it's really obviously very topical given that on Thursday, Facebook's coming out with you know their con Connect uh, conference. We'll be speaking about uh, their new rebranding and what they really have envisioned for the metaverse. And so I thought, let's get started with that conversation now and um, see where it leads us. But um, to start things off, just for housekeeping rules for everyone, uh, please keep your mics and videos off. So, hey, Scott, great hey. to see you. Um, okay. We're going to have your uh, video go off, please, because we're going to record this and then uh, put the, at least the conversation with Joe and Kathleen up on YouTube. And so... We're going to get first started with Joe. Joe's going to give a presentation about his work and his life, so you can get, better, get to know him better. Joe, come back. Um, and then uh, Kathleen will go uh, for another like 10, 20 minutes. And then after that, uh, we'll do a quick fireside chat where you guys can get involved and ask questions and come on screen. And so anyways, without further ado, Joe will go first, and then uh, we'll see Kathleen. All right, take it away, Joe. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Unger. Uh, I am the Chief Ecosystems Officer at a company called uh, Origami Air. I'll share out what this is for. Spa. So hi. Um, so some of you might know me, some of you don't. Uh, I've been around the video game industry and the pen and paper game industry for quite a while. Uh, I really come from Dungeons and Dragons and back in the Midwest. I worked my way through the metaverse as it came to be uh, and is being called today uh, through massive multiplayer online games, motion gaming through consoles. Uh, did some time with, uh, with Zenga and uh, really brought a lot of technology from Unity, from Unreal to life uh, through products called uh, that you might know of. Uh, Borderlands was a project that we did that I did uh, with a team out of LA uh, in concert with Texas. Uh, worked on a game called Sony Sorcery for a while. It's a, really a first person adventure. It really all of this is coming together. Um, but today we're talking about why why uh, why AI uh, why AI in the metaverse why this even matters. Um, and like I put here like uh, hey you got it all over my metaverse because it really is. Uh, my my social reality is this metaverse reality. Uh, every day I walk in, it is to meet people and I live and work in the metaverse every day. Um, I have since the start of the pandemic and we'll, this is what that story really is about. Uh, but how we got here was world building. Uh, for those of you who know the term uh, and seen movies like Dune or, or Star Wars, it's really easy to wrap your head around the idea that somebody built that. When you see something on a screen, when you see something in a book, you know, somebody had to put that world together. And so myself, through video games and through gaming and, and technology, have been using, using these uh, tools and games to build worlds together. Uh, so here you see some of what my partner Trisha Williams and I did back in the day in Pigeonhole Productions that led to here, which is leading world building through USC, uh, the World Building Media Lab at, at USC Cinema. Um, if you don't know Alex McDowell, you should look him up. That would explain a lot of it, what I'm talking about right now. Uh, we've also worked through the future of work, which is where we started to take a lot of this technology and take it out of the IV towers and take it out, out from behind the screen and start to bring it to the people, help them train and use this for real life situations. Um, this really led to a, a culmination point in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, for a couple of years, we worked with the Kaufman Foundation and tried to bring 16 disparate neighborhoods together to create a singular vision of 20 years in the future. Uh, we use virtual reality to do that, but through the process of world building, just like cinema, just like games. And now we help businesses, communities to do that. Uh, it was really about being able to not just see your imagination, but being able to step into it. Uh, the word aphantasia or the lack of fantasy in your head, uh, aphantasic is one of the things we try to help people with, is to bring people together with developers and conversation using the metaverse and virtual reality technologies to build worlds that people can't, can't or have difficulty seeing. Uh, that's when this came along. 
uh, I was originally headed with my team down to Baja, California, to the Baja studios there, and we were going to use cinema technology and and studio sets to start to build this out. But this came along and showed us uh, that in conclusion and with the lockdowns, we had to pull everybody together across the metaverse. Um, the place called Altspace helped us to do that. Uh, but we were also driven by what should we do when we get there? Um, and that's when this came along, really social justice was in the news everywhere. And, you know, we were all locked at home and some of us were taken to the streets, but a lot of us were powerless with nothing to do, either too far away or too removed from, from important pieces of culture to participate. Well, we thought that uh, maybe we could spend our time uh, rather than just surviving, we could invite people along in this journey uh, and create an outreach program, use the metaverse, use these tools of video game design, development, tools of creation, and teams of developers with a bunch of people that uh, might not have those tools or normally have that available to them. Uh, so we started by saying, where should they go? Um, and that's when the first origami airship was born. Um, if you think about uh, the idea of transferring yourself to someplace new, um, taking those first steps, you might think about, you know, walking out your door or getting on a bike to cross town. Um, we're really, we were inspired by, by like cosmos and, um, by the idea of the starship of the imagination. And what if we could make a an airship of the imagination to take people not just to places they couldn't imagine, but to like a, a real future to really pioneer something that they could actually touch, work with, see, be in every day. And we just asked them for for once a week, would you board our airship and and come settle your new home in the metaverse with us? Um, and you know, week after week. We would bring them in, and after bringing them in in VR headsets and immersing them in, we would say, what should, what should we build in these locations? What could you do with a metaverse when you weren't bound by, by real construction rules? If you could imagine a solution and seven days later for it to be there, what, what would you do? Well, they still needed context, and the context for us came down to this idea of the block town. Um, just like the Oregon Trail in days of old, we brought people from across the, the world to the Pacific Northwest to explore, but also to solve problems. Uh, so problems of survival, problems of community, and to start something new. Uh, we didn't want it to go without context, and we asked them to not just develop anything from a gray box of nothing we said no this is a real place to you our cascadia city is real it has values of inclusivity exclusivity life and liberty and we didn't determine what those were going to be on the ground our community did and by going back and forth in um, the product of Altspace by, by Microsoft, we were able to take 10 people who, who really didn't have a lot of this experience uh, through and to a future. Um, we brought them aboard an airship and would take them from 2020 to 2028. And if you see on the slide, we, we created a gap story. We used the power of speculative fiction. Thank you to our, our help and our sponsors in Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. They're experts in this area, right? How do we capture pieces of the future and tell the story together um, and leap to a new place beyond where our normal thinking could go? And this is what, what we did, right? We, we said that put everything on pause, put the, the government on pause, put those daily uh, worries on pause and leap ahead um, to a future where you had the determination to choose what you wanted. And what we found after eight weeks of building, we, we didn't know if people were gonna stay or if it was an interesting experience. And what we wound up with was a town. It started as an X on a map. Um, on, a, on a theoretical metaverse location, right? And this destination uh, gets to the point of what we want to talk about and what the metaverse is. It became a real place. 
Uh, what you see here is a tour from a couple of weeks ago, and that's Ivan. He was our first resident, the first inhabitant of this place, um, an actual extraction worker from the Pacific Northwest and fishing and logging, uh, and opened this store with his wife in our metaverse to sell his goods to the people who came through Altspace. Um, and Others along with him, uh, a chef, Chef O uh, fr 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 from uh, Austin is opening the Nam Bar, uh, a, a VR to table food experience. Uh, we have Better Future, uh, the Better Futures Institute, uh, Better Futures uh, from Dana Anton. She's also bringing people through this as well. We have libraries. We have people that are inhabiting locations. We have a, a resident storyteller who keeps our stories as a community alive. Um, and that's what this metaverse and and this kind of moderated atmosphere allowed us to do. Um, if you look here, you see all of the avatars going back and forth together. And, and you don't think about AI in this situation because you're immersed in the situation. You think about the color of the trees and the color of the sky and the stories you're being told. But um, what you don't see here is I can't frown. I can't be angry. I can't cry in this platform that we used called Altspace. So what does that mean? What does it mean when when AI is moderating our interaction with each other and when you're trying to build a society in a location and when a program is literally standing between our faces? Um, and that led us to create partnerships uh, into the future. Uh, when we sat there last year, we didn't look towards commercialization first. We needed to answer questions. We needed to answer questions of what did we want to do here? What did we really want as a society? I've gone through this from tabletop games to early video games to massive multiplayer games to social games on Facebook to VR as it has stood for the last five to 10 years to now. And there are a lot of lessons along that way of what lessons from data collection from Facebook do we need to learn and to avoid? What lessons from the game industry around culture creation and uh, community creation do we need to learn and do we need to avoid? Um, so we teamed up with the UCSD and the Stanford Institute for Compassion and Empathy and the Compassion Institute, as well as the Clark Center. And through a couple of grants, we're experimenting in alt space with, can we translate human compassion into social VR? What does that mean? What does that say? And, and how can we make it persist and part of who we are as a fabric of a company? And can we bring empathy uh, to social VR? Here, what you see is, is a uh, protest that we're creating a simulation of that is based on real research from real people, real interviews going out into the world from first responders who need to get into these situations and get out and may have to play a neutral party. And what happens when they are faced with a choice, right? And can, can this help them even in its moderated instance can, uh, where my face can't be angry, can this situation still still give us the feeling of being in a protest? Like what you see here, right? These are alt space avatars um, simulating a mask, pro mask unmask mandate protest. And here is an individual yelling at my avatar. Um, out of context, he might, might be anything, joy, but if you look at what is happening on the screen and the eyes and the face shapes of all of these individuals, those looks, that's all procedural generation via an in, in AI that is, that is trying to help us communicate. Um, and is it doing its job here? Is it allowing us to effectively create a protest in social VR when we can't, we can't look angry? Like, how do we still look angry? So really a long way, right, uh, of, the, of coming forward and what are we still doing? Like uh, my group and I are, are, are origami air is a network of individuals like this who are coming together to build a metaverse based on human relations, human people, human interaction, and trying to understand how to design the, the best situation and the best 
um, community to carry forward the values from our real world into uh, a social metaverse. So um, there we are. Let's set it up. I uh, hopefully set enough so that, that it makes some sense. I think I only used 10 of my 20 minutes. Questions, okay. comments, concerns. Hi, Kathleen. That was awesome. I hand it over to you. Thank you. No, that was awesome. I'm like, ah, I got questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Todd, are you jumping in? Uh, no, you can just go uh, right on into your presentation. Oh, high five over to you. Oh, yeah. right on. Um, all right, let's see here. Let's share my screen. And. I'm, I'm letting my avatar do this talking. Um, can you guys all see this? I'm going with yes, because everybody's on mute. Uh, Todd, tell me if you can't hear me. Yes, yes I, can, I hear can hear you and I can see it. You're ah, good. awesome, okay. Um, Joe, that was awesome. I, I, like I want a sidebar. I want to go out and have chats with you. Um, Todd, I'm so happy to be here. And you know what? I'm just like, I love ALA in person. So doing this in this capacity is second best, but I can't wait for us to get back together. So thank you for including me. Um, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an overview. It's, it's good, Joe, that you focused on the metaverse. I'm going to focus a little bit on the digital twins and virtual beings aspect of the metaverse and give a little overview of where I came from and this new creative driven economy that we're all in and then talk about a current project that I'm working on right now. So I often get called three things. I often get called a tech humanist. I get called an XR experience strategist and a futurist. And, you know, at the, at the get-go, I'm a creative first and foremost. And the question is like, well, really what's a tech humanist today? And of course I focus on the relationship like HCI coming out of, you know, academia between tech and humanity first. And over 25 years, I keep dropping into this being my core value in all the product development that I've done. I keep coming back to like, where are the humans in this? And, and, you know, we're the ones that are building this. What do we really want? So <clears throat> I know AI ultimately is going to reflect back and continue to reflect back all of our biases. And I ask who's really holding that ethical framework at the end of the day. And when every living or inanimate object is going to have some kind of AI and we walk outside and that's going to be our school, you know, who are those people exactly that are programming that AI and how is that actually going to be informed for us? Those are the things that I think about. Do those folks come from behavioral psychology and cultural anthropology and do they come from social, you know, sociology training? So that's my focus as a tech humanist. <clears throat> When you go into XR as an experience strategist and not necessarily a producer of content, which is what I have come from, I really am looking at one level above that when I'm working with clients and saying, what's the why, right? This is how I get paid as an XR experience strategist. And the why is, yeah, we can build you a reality, but why are we doing it? And I remember way back in the day thinking, Burger King, why do you need a website? That's how old I am. Why do you need a website, Burger King? And now you wouldn't even think web, you know, how could you imagine Burger King without a website? So anyway, all of the clients I work with run the gamut from futurists in media and entertainment to, believe it or not, the death care industry, unlike the healthcare industry and death care, meaning cemeteries and funeral homes. And I also work in the health care, like I said, um, recently with Anthem AI and in the environmental industries. So all of them have challenges when it comes to avatars and the metaverse. So when I get called out in Forbes magazine by Kathy Hackle, thank you so much, Kathy, for calling me a digital embalmer. It's a title that like no girl A ever thought she'd have and B, what the hell is it? So this digital embalming um, part of my career is really interesting and fascinating because I really look at family services rather than just creating a hologram for uh, an upsell for somebody who is dealing with... Um, funerals and funeral planning. But being a futurist to me is probably because my whole career I've been building five years ahead. And I guess I just got sort of a trained eye to what's next. So this is a visual. Um, this is fun. I was happy. I was a happy classical antiquity painter. And then I wanted a big scale and I went muralist. 
And then I wanted more tactile and I became a glass blower. And then I thought I'd be an industrial designer and a glass architect. And then somebody called me and said, Kathleen, can you, you have to get on the box. You're creative. And I was like, there's no chance. If you're saying computers to me, there's no chance. So fast forward, there I was, Silicon Graphics, SGI and Silicon Studios, thinking I was gonna be a VFX animator. And the right side of this journey map is 25 years. And that 25 years started with Glassblower one day, now part of Medal of Honor and DreamWorks Interactive and PlayStation One making video games. So we were world building at a time where, you know, it was a different in industry where <laughs> the VFX community frowned on the gaming community. And it's so funny to see where we are today. So from DreamWorks, I went to IBM Innovation, hoping, and this is when EA bought our division of DreamWorks and I didn't want to go on to FIFA or Madden or Motu. So I went to IBM Innovation thinking I'd leverage um, holograms. And IBM had 8,000 patents that were so fascinating, but it was like Shark Tank and I got my MBA overnight and I never touched a hologram. And then I went to Disney, uh, to launch disneyworld.com and then got invited to re-architect EBCOT with new technology, which was like an ask of a creative group, a small group that went on to become the My Magic Band, the Magic Plus Magic Band team, 13 years of development. I didn't stay at all. I left and went and opened my own consultancy, the Collaboratorium, right when the recession hit and thought, oh, this is like the worst time you could ever do this. And I started bridging the gap from content over to the marketing advertising side and thought, well, is do they have any budgets left? Does anybody have any budgets left? And I became a digital strategist. And then I got this crazy gig on Capitol Hill, which was actually in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center to tell the contemporary story of the US Constitution. And then Snowden happened. And that actually became a big, you know, that was difficult to, you know, try and make content when you have Supreme Court justices saying we haven't dealt with privacy and data and how we're handling that. So the answer is no. So I came back to LA to do AR VR projects and that sort of led me into a couple things around this focus on virtual beings, digital humans and how it all relates to the metaverse. So inadvertently, I focus on experience design from traditional in real life experience design and how that translates to the metaverse. And on a side note, I recently joined the Holoride team which um, Holoride, as an, a, a board member, and Holoride is a German innovation tech company that spun out of Audi that focuses on the future of in-vehicle entertainment linking XR with real-time motion data. So that's been a real joy to be part of that team to see how we actually look at the metaverse from that lens of location-based entertainment. So I've weathered several eras, right? So I weathered this interactive era that we all went through. I've weathered the integrated media era or transmedia era. And now we're sort of embarking on this virtual and experiential immersive era. And here's why it's so important to really understand. This slide is a lot, I know, but just like deal with the blue part right now and the triangle that I have made conveniently, which is we're this red dot. We are two thirds into this integrated media era where the rest of the world lives and we're embarking in this future immersive era right now. And what's so interesting about this is we can talk about what future technologies are hitting us, right? From DeFi and NFTs and blockchain and autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, you go down the list, brain computer interfaces. And, you know, I was a digital immigrant. They're the digital natives, but now there are digital imaginatives this next generation that is just looking at this completely different. And if we look at this timeline, what makes it so important is that this timeline is 24 years between today. And if you are following Kurzweil and you believe in obviously, you know, artificial super intelligence takeover and the singularity, that's 24 years. So everything you've ever done from 1997 to today, is what we're talking about forward. And it's not that far away. And at the same time, it's still gonna be the developer years. My whole career, I've been buying into it. We're in the developer years, Kathleen. And then when I looked at this and I laid this map out, I'm like, we're gonna be in the developer years my entire life. So, so who do we wanna be during this developer years moment, right? So in 2018, I was listening to Jack Ma at the World Economic Forum, Jack Ma, um, Alibaba. He, and he pulled himself by, you know, himself up by his own bootstraps. And he basically said, after AI surpasses us, everything in orange on the left, AI is not going to take this from us. 
you know, we still have values. We still believe in teamwork and care for others and independent thinking. And then I started to think, well, my list on the right, AI is not going to take any of this, right? AI is not going to take my creativity or take my gut instinct or take my human ingenuity or my joy. Is that true? And, and, and it's a critical moment right now, right? It's our responsibility to define all of this. And the question that I keep asking is like, where is our own agency in all of this? Who's scripting my story versus me scripting my own story? So in 2018, I started thinking about a talk on Meet Your Digital Twin. It's um, up on YouTube, but I'm just going to do a short clip basically of what that whole talk was about because it's just so funny that in 2018, as I was writing it, maybe 17 thinking of it, 18 writing it and delivering it. And now fast forward, nobody ever thought obviously COVID was going to be the, sadly, the best thing that ever happened to everybody in this industry. And for myself, I lost my mother to COVID. So I'm really bittersweet about how this all relates to me. But in, in this instance, the whole world understands virtual. Everybody that ever said to me, Kathleen, what is it that you exactly do? And now it's like, oh, you do virtual conferences. I'm like, I no, it's not that. But we're breaking out of the screen, which is everything I've ever wanted to do, back to being a tactile physical artist, right? So we're headed into a sense-making era. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a family story, which is part of my, my talk. And um, it's interesting. Our family came to Los Angeles at the turn of the century because Sid Grauman had summoned my great-grandfather, who was a symphony conductor with a hundred-piece orchestra who came from Russia to New York. And Sid Grauman wanted somebody to open up his silent movies, or he was working prior to that on trying to create something really unique and innovative that was a musical experience that nobody had ever seen yet. And this is my grandmother who would tell me all the stories about she being a young girl on the Pullman car coming across the country with Floridora girls and, you know, all of the orchestra. So in 19, I mean, in 2002, I had to bury my grandmother at 98 and she was to be buried at Hollywood Forever, which everybody knows is a cultural epicenter, right, of Los Angeles. So I'm in the funeral home and I'm talking to the woman and she's like, listen, I just got to tell you, we can't bury your grandmother right now because Six Feet Under is in production here and we can't do both at the same time. So you're going to have to wait. And I was sort of like, you know, we can't wait. We have three days to, to bury her. And they said, do you want us to capture her DNA in the meantime? And I had no idea what she was talking about. I, I was like, what, do you, what are you even talking about? You guys capture DNA. What do you do with it? She said, we have a production facility upstairs. We'll capture her DNA. You may want it for later. But in the meantime, I was scratching my head like, no, we just have to bury her. What is with you people? And, and by the way, I never, I never did get her DNA. But uh, the point being is this is what was happening at the time, right? Minority Report 2002 was happening. And the Nokia had just gotten a, the feature phone had just gotten a camera. Like that was the big deal. And I knew that Steven Spielberg had convened a futurist convention for this movie so it would hold up in the future, which obviously it does. But you start thinking like Hollywood forever, the fantasy reality, you don't go there to die, right? You go there to live. You're trying, they're trying to create immortality of which I'm happy to say that I will be part of creating immortality at Hollywood forever, uh, fingers crossed. So fast forward from 2002, 2013, this movie comes out. Robin Wright, she's playing the Princess Bride in this movie, and she's washed up as an aging actress. And her agent says, look, you're a mess. You can't work, but your likeness can work. So this is the first time Hollywood now is like pitching our future. And we're seeing that your likeness can work. So it begs this big question, right? Is giving up one part of myself in exchange for freedom in another domain, is it worth it? And does my likeness, is my likeness ever going to hold more value than my real self? And with regards, like I said, to agency and ownership of myself, that's what led me into this research to find out how many people were working on digital humans or digital likeness or human likeness. And so I identified these 12 companies. Just in this alone, I started to look at how everybody was coming to the table, whether you were a robot becoming human, whether you were a human becoming more obviously, you know, with an AI and more roboticized, we're becoming the product, right? The humans now, our facial expressions, our habits, our behaviors, now we're the product, the way we move, our dance move ends up in Fortnite. All of our signature moves right now are gonna be body shopped 
and what's so meaningful about me to be sold separately? I'm starting to think of myself in parts, not even as my whole right now. So these 12 companies are all working on very different solutions and all these different phrases, right? Is there a shared grammar yet? Do we have a shared definition about, are we chasing fidelity? Is it about interactions? And who's gonna be the company that really owns your intent beyond everything else about you? And after these 12 companies, I found a whole list of 23 more companies with unique and different names around digital likeness. And I was like, this is the wild west right now. Everybody's re you know, representing some kind of human progress. And in LA, right, you know, like I said, we chase fidelity, but when is it gonna be that I send my twin to my friend's wedding because I can't show up? And when is that gonna be socially acceptable? So the way I look at this architecture is in three ways. I look at our digital avatar, and then I look at the behavioral psychology of your avatar in relationship to other avatars. And then what's the world in which all of these avatars are in, in the metaverse? And what's that relationship gonna be when the actual world is smart and everything constructed around it is smart? So I went to AWS and I said, I know they're doing industrialization and manufacturing of their entire workflow pipeline. So what do they define as a digital twin? And maybe we can just pull over what AWS says is a digital twin into a human twin. And is there really a delta or a difference in doing that? And I can get into that because that's a whole separate talk on what makes up you, number two. What are the five personas of you? But you know, what, this really begs a question, which is, do I want to be myself as a twin? Because maybe I had a physical di you know, disability and I was polarized in communities, or maybe I want to swap my race or my gender on a you know, hourly basis, on a decade basis. And if you change you know, your cookie sets right now online, your digital footprint is a new you. So this begins to beg a lot of questions on the psychology and the behavior, right? And this was in 2018. And I'm looking at this today saying it's so relevant today because more people are understanding the gravity of all of this. So this is really the point, right? We're again in the gap. We're sitting in this gap between humans having digital twins and humanoids becoming real identities. So what happens in this gap? We, we have to have trust. We are sitting in total vulnerability right now. You know, obviously with deep fakes, there's so much trickery going on, but, but what are we gonna learn from all of this? Especially when you see that all of the funding and so much of it right now is virtual influencers inside gaming engines. And when you look at this and you say, okay, so little Michaela right now has, she may even have six, this could be old data, 3 million verified Instagram followers, it might be true. And then Fortnite, which is pulling in 318 million a month, and that's old data too. So to put it in perspective, the Avengers Infinity War with their highest grossing, which was the highest grossing film in 2018, was pulling in 2.1 billion in their lifetime revenue at the global box office. That's only six and a half months of Fortnite's revenue. So you can see where everybody's throwing money. And, you know, obviously I come from gaming and I believe in world building, but I have a fundamental issue. And this is a video, I'm not going to play it just for time purposes, but this is Kaichi Matsudo's hyper reality video that came out three years ago, which still holds weight. And this is in Medellin. This is what the, you know, your life would look like if it was built on the backbone of a gaming engine on this rewards based model of trying to level people up. And so I ask where are the true urban planners right now, where are the placemakers, where is building community with value? And, and I don't know if you saw this, I saw this on the plane a couple of weeks ago, coming back from New York, the street gang Sesame streets um, documentary. The executive producer said, if TV loved you, that was the reason why we created Sesame Street instead of consumerism. So I say, if, if the metaverse loved you, would it be about consumerism? What would the metaverse be, right? Because we shape this. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about, which, and that was a, just a blip of my much longer version of a talk, is I'm currently an art resident in Boise at Searle's Place. And what's so funny about this is that I have a relationship with Boise for the last 10 years. I've been part of Tree Fort and Hack Fort's community and contributing to the community. And when my mom passed away and I kind of wanted to check out, my friend said, why don't you just take the art residency at Searle's Place and check out and get back to your roots, which I thought was great. So my original idea was that I was gonna recreate a community member as a digital twin with an AI and gift it back to the city of Boise as a community influencer. 
as a listening campaign for the city as that city is dealing with tremendous amount of growth, right? So I was kind of like, I'm gonna create a persistent avatar. So I get a call from the executive director and they say, well, we love your application, Kathleen, but we don't even know what immersive arts is. We have people on our panel that can actually, you know, review video art. Is it video art? And I said, no, I'm not going to ever be your first immersive artist. I mean, I might be your first immersive artist. I'm not going to be your last. After me, there will be so many people who are going to want to take art residencies as immersive artists. So let me help you explain what that is. And they said, let's pin that maybe for 2022. Well, what happened? Their Colombian artist could not get a visa because of the Delta variant. So they called and they said, do you want to just jump in now? I said, sure. So I started calling in my collaborators. I hoped to find a volumetric capture stage in Boise. There was none. And I became what ultimately is the first immersive artist at Searle's place. But the irony is Boise had COVID so bad and, and it's still sitting at its peak that I physically couldn't even show up and do what I thought I'd be doing with my collaborators. So I'm now kind of like Banksy. They've never seen my face. They don't know who I am. My avatar sits at Searle's house in the recreation that we did, which thank goodness I have good collaborators that were able to go and actually scan the house that we have recreated in Spatial IO. And we are inviting people throughout this residency to come and have conversations and to look at the work that we're creating. But the point is we're in this tribrid moment, right? So this is a moment where we're no longer just digital and physical hybrid experiences. We are physical, digital, and virtual experiences. So it's a signature moment for storytelling to stitch all of this together. So I call it the tribrid moment. I have yet to hear anybody else call it that. I hope people begin to understand what this means to have experiences in all three ways of expression. So what this project is, is I had to shift gears when there was no volumetric stage and I couldn't create a digital twin. And so I started talking to my collaborators from Black Box VR to the Autism Mixed Reality Institute and the University of Idaho's Virtual Technology and Design um, Department. And what I found is these projects on creating XR stories for neurodiverse communities, as well as indigenous people's communities, was a really interesting proposition to say, if we put these two worlds together, these unlikely fellows, could we find a through line? So right now we are in this uncharted territory of finding out what is the through line between neurodiversity and indigenous peoples. And let me tell you, this is a big lesson for me. I am learning an unbelievable amount of what are the ultimate themes that drive the realities of folks in the indigenous communities and why XR and the metaverse and XR storytelling is so relevant and so necessary, as well as how the neurodiverse community uses XR so easily and, and adopts so easily to this space that maybe the two can learn from each other. So in conclusion, XR stories, nothing about us without us. Um, our final art happening experience is on November 5th. We did uh, on two weeks ago in Spatial IO, we invited the community to come with us and we walked through uh, six portals of first recreating what the house was, establishing the house in the metaverse, and then allowing folks to go from portal to portal into an indigenous tribes platform, and then into a neurodiverse platform to understand how we tell stories. So yeah, I'm sitting in a moment, I'm gonna put myself back on, and um, that is, that is it. I'm going to stop sharing right now. Brad. Fun, fun stuff. <laughs> so many questions. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'm just looking at chat. It's Todd talking. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can. All right, perfect. All right, we're good. Um, so I think we should just get right into the first question that we actually already had planned to talk about is like this definition of what metaverse is, right? Um, 
I feel like who would like to go first about what they they feel? I know Kathleen, you uh, were showing it an article earlier from uh, Tony uh, Parisi on yeah. um, I think it was like what seven rules of uh, the metaverse, right? Yeah, I mean, I was happy to see that that has been put down on paper and established, and you know, obviously, like you were talking about with Facebook's big play on you know building out their future. I'm glad I'm glad that article came out for sure and and how we all adopt to it and if people are you know are we doing walled gardens are we doing open access what's it going to look like and Facebook as a utility is not a bad idea. Yeah, I think um, it really pointed out um, I'm going to look it up, but uh, the the idea of the metaverse as the singular connected thing that connects VR, AR, AR XR, uh, MR, social internet with the normal internet, with gaming, like all of that, the, it's a convergence. And I think uh, people always have a hard time understanding, let alone describing a convergence technology, because we're always trying to wall wall garden it so to speak right bit things off into small things that we can easily understand and and the metaverse is is all of that together it's all of your video games living at once and accessible at once um via one platform uh, form right we're, we're we're in such a nascent time of this uh but the transferability between um, like a, a lot of what Kathleen works on with Spatial I.O. I love what Microsoft is doing with Spatial and how they changed this year to Microsoft Mesh. Um, the platform that, that I operate on is Altspace, which is now part of the Mesh family. So now the things that Kathleen and I work on can, are now shareable, are now transferable as these, these things start to come. So it's the convergence of of these technologies of spatial computing, social computing, life and work, right? I mean, have you guys seen the news recently about like Roblox? Um, how do you see like uh, companies against Roblox and this Fortnite and other types of uh, already very popular games and how that is gonna, I guess, transition us into uh, this quote unquote metaverse, right? You guys give us a little bit more uh, color on that. You know what I keep going back to? I want to walk outside and is someone going to tell me I'm walking into Roblox or am I walking into Decentraland? Am I walking into Sandbox? You know, what? can I just walk outside? Does somebody have to own that? Can I just have my expression? And, and, and yes, you can put up all your shops. That's fine. But do I have that autonomy? And will I have that autonomy? So, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm so for all the creative expression that we're, that we're going through right now. I'm 100% behind it. And I keep seeing the long game and saying, are we doing this on the backbone of gaming engines always? Is that it? Or is, that, is that where we're going? And when does that change? So I don't no, know, Joe. I, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, through both of our careers, right, between we've seen there's a ton of of capability and free has always helped in in mm -hmm. uh, adaptation of 3D software, right? Um, it used to be that you had to pay a million dollars or five million to get a glimpse at Unreal when it was yeah. in its 3D package, right? And then Unity came along and, uh, and made that same sort of technology free. Mm -hmm. You know, Coco Studio X tried to do that a little bit, if you guys are game nerds, um, on more of a Linux front, a free uh, a front on that side. But I think, uh, honestly, the only effort that I really see that is open enough is what Microsoft's doing with Spatial. Mm -hmm. um, the, and even with Epic, um, going head to head with Apple, which is the mm -hmm. ultimate walled garden behind mm -hmm. all that. They want to control your headset, your right. your software, you're making it with uh, everything top to bottom, right? Um, where Microsoft is playing really well with Epic. They're both into a more decentralized, give you the mm -hmm. tools. So I'm really interested. I think Epic is always going to mine money because they're really good at mining money out of these spaces. I and mean, Fortnite is amazing from a from an economic developer's yeah. point of view but um that the frontier when you look at like um 
Satya's book, um, mm -hmm. Satya Nadella's book on, on mm -hmm. envisioning what this really means. It's empowering communities and mm -hmm. it's always community first. You know, um, what community is making, the thing you're making is going to end up defining how you live in it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. you know, it's funny. I, I have a couple thoughts. One is um, Amy Jupiter from Disney, former, former Disney Imagineering, who's now working with Virgin Galactic. Um, Amy and I banter a lot on in real life versus XR, because you're talking yeah. about somebody who knows how to create a safe space, a space where there's joy and where there's happiness. And what does that take? And, it, and it's, um, you know, uh, part of the book on the reading list, uh, Todd, that I had sent over, which is um, Walt Disney and the Promise of Progress City. Um, in talking to Amy, and, and I'm still just looking at it, I just got the book and I'm thumbing through it myself saying, what was this about? And being somebody who was formerly at Disney myself, Epcot was, the, the, the promise was not Epcot. The promise was a progress city in this book. Yeah. And it's phenomenal to see that and say, when are we going to get there? When is that, when is in, you know, in real life versus the XR, when does in real life really matter? So I still look at traditional urban planning and say, that's what, that's what we need still at the table. Yeah. I really think you hit on it a lot there, I think, with um, with Epcot, right? Uh, you got Bucky Fuller's kind of concepts really driving the yeah. idea, even hitting Disney hard. Right? And yeah. if uh, guys look up Buckminster Fuller, the yeah. Spaceship Earth, you should. Um, mm -hmm. But that idea of uh, making more with less, the more humanity goes along, the more we can make with less. And I don't even know if Bucky foresaw that what we could make with light Mm -hmm. Right. Like um, even the, the forgot the name, but the hologram company that just get, got out, uh, defining it hard light. Uh, it's been, the idea of holograms is hard light. Mm -hmm. But that in our mind, you know, Hollywood has sold us, like you point out on, on Minority Report, reaching out yeah. and touching it and not pass through it. Mm -hmm. But whether you're in a headset or whether anything, it's, it, this ghost layer on the world mm -hmm. is there. It is a. Um, it's almost a manifestation of all of the stuff we talk about in spiritual, uh, spirituality, yeah. the stuff we can't see that's floating yep. around us all the time, the radio and television signals that we could tune in and see. You know, we're just, the tech isn't quite there yet, but we're there, but right? Like we well, let the FCC write what we want on, F on TV and radio, but now if we're gonna, if you're gonna pave over my house with hard light, and with AI avatars, it's like you, you see that in um, a Niantic, right? Putting yeah. Pokemon in your backyard. Yeah, yeah. Um, on a side note, um, in using spatial IO, what's really interesting is the first barrier of entry we had is uh, we, have, um, we have a unique person on our team who uh, identifies as they, them, and is wonderful just creatively in all, like, in all ways. And spatial IO, only has male or female avatars. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you were like, epic fail, epic. You can't, I can't even ask somebody to show up in the room and to converse if they cannot identify. And it is so obvious before this would, so, so obviously I escalated it like the hell out of that. And I knew their DEI person would get back in touch with me and say, yes, I'm sure we've been trying to work on this internally, but it's not part of, you know, our requirements this year. I don't know, but it's not okay. It's definitely not okay. Not at this point, not where we're bringing the metaverse together in, um, you know, in, in such an inclusive way. So that's a big limitation. And I obviously said, I can't move forward on your platform if this doesn't get fixed like now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so do other platforms offer that? Sure. You know, how do they limit that? But they have so many other good things to offer. It's really hard. So that's I, like the little step I could take in changing this and and hoping to see that quicker and also you know i think with the social dilemma and 20 years later watching all these engineers realize their choices with their like button and a polarized community of young teenagers committing suicide and now being on the hook for that data and now saying and it's in the news every single day you know they were in the know they weren't in the know now they're on the hook for it so everybody's accountability towards how we move there might might not happen it might happen faster. It might happen faster because people aren't going to be able to tolerate it. I don't know. Well, we're in that moment, right? The great resignation that we're in yeah, right now. Right. Like yes. so many people walking off. And um, if you look at entertainment in 
the, the entertainment and technology drive what we see on our screens, right? Mm -hmm. um, the walk-offs in entertainment on crew, I think um, are indicative of what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, that the people in engineering and running the labs that have for the last 20, 30 years um, have kind of consistently done so. Mm -hmm. and, for, and the minimal changing of the guard, a lot of the 1990s still driving choice um, even though, I mean, we have 30 years of understanding what this technology does, data that we can measure against, but yet our, our KPIs, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to a business decision or key performance indicators are still driven by 1990 capital rather yep. than uh, attention capital, rather than right. human capital, like the people in the room making it, like I, it, that you're in their making is the most important thing for me, right? Mm -hmm. Like that you are raising those, those, those topics that you are building teams to take on those topics in and against a monopoly, a, a economy uh, mm -hmm. it's going to take a community of all of us right to mm -hmm. start a lot of fires in a lot of these corners because we're all stuck on the same tool sets we're all yeah. stuck a little bit with uh with windows we're all stuck a little mm -hmm. bit with apple we're all mm -hmm. stuck with with epic and unity so how do how does the community raise our voice together and coordinate in order to drive the change that you're talking about well there's often even more intimacy in an integration that offers your spatial audio than there is looking for the fidelity of your character in an environment. It's so sometimes so much more intimate. All of a sudden, I'm like, I might be in an alt space avatar, but I'm with somebody who I know is sitting in their living room. I'm hoping their living room and not anywhere else. And uh, having a conversation that is so intimate and I kind of like need space. I need to sort of step back. So like, it's crazy that we're chasing this idea from Hollywood that it has to be the best, best, best when uh, these integrations are solving so much already. There's so much happening already. Yeah, and, and around identity, like um, yeah. I, you have your alt space identity or your uh, spatial uh, uh, avatar behind you. And I live and work in that avatar. And yes. if you go on <laughs> my side, I live and work in one of those avatars yeah. every day, have it for 18 months now. My team does, the people we bring on do. And it's such a powerful tool. Like when you talk about yes. neurodivergence, yeah. um, uh, I, it, representation in a space where you're not, uh, there is no age, there is no height, yeah. right? The, the, what you put on is who you are. Your voice literally yeah. is the one thing that matters in, in um, something like that, that is driven yeah. by, by space and, and these little, little uh, AI driven facial expressions. I can, um, Todd, if you want, I don't know time-wise, um, I can show a little clip of the video of what we did in spatial with some of the folks touring a couple of the um, portals, um, if you want. But one thing that was noticeable in there and it came up afterwards, which is, look, Kathleen, don't ask for assimilation from the neurodivergent community in like, don't ask the community to join when that might not be how the community would join. And I am asking for assimilation from groups of people that, especially from indigenous peoples, I'm not in the community. Their time is the space time relevance is not my time and how that looks everything that I imagine of how I'm creating an experience is thrown out the window completely. I just sort of keep the framework open and see what happens. So it was really interesting in going through these different portals and what we learned. And um, I'm, I'm in this challenge of a moment of what's the art and what I have I've done for my whole career in making product. And those are very two different experiences. Well, I think that could lead into a good question that came up actually with Ross Mead in the chat, where it's talking about like, what's a uh, new, unique and distinguishing technologies that are being developed or that need to be developed in order to support this metaverse versus gaming. And so maybe you can talk about like, what, what are the tools that haven't been developed yet or what is like the infrastructure that hasn't been developed yet? Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, obviously NFTs, NFTs and the whole like it's funneling and fueling this I don't know if I'm answering the question but I it's like one doesn't live without the other at this point and so therefore it's really driving a consumerism which whether I'm a fan or not doesn't matter here but I'm trying to figure out the human aspect of 
um, of where NFTs and blockchain and crypto fuel this metaverse. But maybe you have to ask the question again so I understand it differently. But it seems to be like that's the technology in the room. It's 50% weighted on top of all the developers creating worlds and digital humans or virtual beings. Even what, um, you know, the virtual being summit is next weekend, uh, Ed Saatchi's uh, virtual being summit. And uh, we just recently launched the culture DAO, the uh, DAO for that. And it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how these two worlds meet. Uh, I think um, when you look at something like Epic and Unity to um, where they might be born in games and gaming, and the I, we've all learned quite a bit, right? Spent my entire life in this industry, and uh, I'm an old hat that shipped more zombie games and grinders than you can think, right? Like, and uh, it killed my fair share of dragons. Uh, those experiments are gateways to digital literacy, and right now we're mm -hmm. at a real critical point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there's vast parts of the world that have very little access to the internet. The people who are going to build and develop the the mm -hmm. the metaverse are the top 10% of the world who mm -hmm. have access to high speed internet, have enough money to get a headset, a computer, or a rig that can run it, um, and access to tools. So if you want to compete or don't want game tools to run it, make a billion dollar 30 year tool that has uh, millions of users and is free. Mm -hmm. um, it's, those are going to be the tools. The, the consideration of where we're at, where this big conversation goes, of those of us who have been once bitten twice shy by the game industry and, and the whole conversation around it right now and you know, dopamine manipulation, all of that stuff that we're all facing as a society. It, you know, video games didn't give you the notice. That was Apple. That little ding that rules your day, mm -hmm. that was Apple. That wasn't video mm -hmm. games, right? Mm -hmm. like, take a look at who we're blaming, one, and understand what these, these engines are. Yes, you understand them as games, but they are world building engines. They replicate physics. They have no morality. They have no system in there in order to make an economy. You have to write a, an economy in. Like you, that is created by humans, not mm -hmm. AI, humans, you, me, here, all of us. We are going to choose to use this or not use this to make us better or to allow us to make it easy. Mm -hmm. We have spent the last 20 years making it easy. Um, we've got it. We've got some problems to fix. I know my my network and my group are up to solving problems. We're using these tools, right? Call them games. Sure. But games are a digital literacy tool that I can use to teach a seven-year-old how to put uh, Minecraft blocks into place. And then I can take that seven-year-old when they're 14, have them start to make their community together. And in, when they're 21, they can be out there and self-sufficient with these tools. They don't necessarily need your job. They need these tools. Sorry, a little soapboxy there. Love it. That's great. Um, I mean, I guess where I'm going is like, I was reading this article that was actually with uh, A16Z and they were talk talking about like the progression of developing content. And this whole graph I'm looking at right now as I talk is about, you know, you have this professionally created content, then user generated content. Then you have this, what we're in right now, AI is what we're starting to do, AI is just a generated content, right? User generated content. Then there's this moment in time where you have fully AI created content, right? I guess like with the uh, with what we're about to find out, I guess on Thursday with Facebook, like what where do you think Facebook plays a role? How how Facebook's going to play a role in the metaverse? And with you know the obviously the mistrust we have, we were talking about trust earlier and ethics and like you know so many things around you know just moral the moral dilemmas there. And how do you think Facebook's really going to be able to rebrand themselves and you know have a be able to be a, a, a contributor to the metaverse, right? That's supposed to be free and open. Well, did I say this before? Maybe I did. They're, you know, they're targeting the EU and they're targeting GDPR and they're targeting, you know, how Europe has looked at our digital rights and said, we're going to put 10,000 new people on that and we're going to start with that. 
Is that bad? No, that seems like it's in the right direction. How I, you know, you can talk strategy all day of what that means, but that is the right move moving forward. And thankfully, in January, um, because I participate in the Area Awards in Europa Park, uh, we're going to bring the minister who created the GDPR standards to talk about what this is going to look like with Facebook and the metaverse in Europe for the next 10 years and or next five years, 10,000 employees to build that out. Yeah, I think you're looking at, uh, I mean, when face, Facebook goes into anything, it's iterative mm -hmm. and um, they iterate on policy, mm -hmm. which might be the single most exciting and terrifying thing in the world when you have the world's largest collected society on anything um kind of trying to make decisions together um gee i hope it winds up better than last time um i don't know i i i view facebook as a, a very large community of enablers who are very focused on policy i hope they retain a focus on policy mm -hmm. and and access um uh, because a Given access to tools and technology, people can advance themselves, right? And and shared communities of learning, which I hope they put the effort on. Um, you know, that's where that's how I will be using the platform. We use Oculus. It is it is a fantastic headset. Um, you know, a, what data they pull off of those is is a risk, but it is also a gateway right now as we all experiment on what the the frontier of policy for this will be. It's like, um, what other players, I mean, besides Facebook, who else, you know, you're very active in alt, alt VR. You're talking about, you know, um, Minecraft. I was talking about earlier, Roblox. Um, where else do you see like, you know, a good developer, I guess a good community, right? Where there's developers and they're working on top of a platform uh, that's, you know, etching towards this metaverse that we've been speaking of. Is there anything else that's top of mind? You know, what came top of mind was today, I, I was reading about BMW's um, Omniverse and they've got an entire pipeline and workflow with their, uh, they got 56,000 employees and they have an entire pipeline to their omniverse with all digital humans running it. So it was really fascinating seeing this in the workforce and seeing it rolled out and seeing what kind of, you know, again, operational health data, what these digital humans are now reporting, who they are in their person, in their experience, you know, managing the workflow of that whole twinned operation. And to me, there's going to be so much information gathered from that that it's exciting to see beyond media and entertainment um, how that plays out in, you know, and, and, and also some of the work that I'm doing too right now in healthcare and how, how can I help somebody who can't get out of their home to get to a facility and what does that mean to represent the metaverse and the, you know, and a digital human in that capacity. So... Yeah. Yeah. and double down on what Kathleen said and, and um, uh, say that NVIDIA is probably yeah. a, a quiet player. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're loud in their own rights if you're in a, in a, a developer, but especially in the areas of digital twinning, yeah. um, infrastructure access, you know, totally. really how this stuff gets used by cities to, uh, yeah. to make decisions on daily life. Um, I would really take a closer look at NVIDIA going forward. Their conference is next week, or not next week, their conference is the same week as AWE, I think starting 8th, 9th, 10th versus AWE's 9th, 10th, 11th, I think. Yeah, but they're giving um, free tickets right now, this week I saw. Go get them. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm a big fan of NVIDIA. <laughs> yeah, it's some amazing work right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've been really loving uh, NVIDIA in healthcare and the metaverse was doing everything. Um, they've been pretty active, obviously. Um, Stephen Kwok has asked a question about there's a lot of polar, polarization, division, extremism on social media, right? Uh, we've seen that a lot lately. What can be done to avoid these problems in the metaverse and foster a more genuine sense of community? It's too late. Um, they, and seriously, like if you look at the you have to look at the existing metaverses that are robust and have a lot of people. Um, if you look at Grand Theft Auto, 
Um, that is a robust active metaverse with uh, millions of players that are in there every day. Um, there were active George Floyd protests. There are active mask mandate protests. There were active protests and violence around mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Um, so it's unavoidable. It is how, what policies do we set in place and what sort of environments do we, even do we create? Like uh, we're experimenting with creating social protests, right? Um, people are people, right? So how do, we, how do we create policy together to go forward uh, that, that we can make sure spaces are safe? Well, it, it also starts with the ambassadors, right? The ambassadors are your trusted go-to uh, as much voice as they have or don't because they usually don't have that kind of authority, but they should be empowered to, to create that. I, I think of Second Life. I think of, the, <coughs> excuse me, my purchasing some real estate on an island in Second Life and somebody came and purchased massive real estate around me so I couldn't see the water and they built up. And I was like, this is like Burning Man, seven miles of empty space and we're capitalists on top of each other like junkyard dogs. Like what? what I don't even understand the logic. And, uh, I, you know, it's sure it's, it's there. So to me, there should be a framework or principle set that whether ambassadors or whomever, it's baked, it has to be baked into the principles. All right. You had, uh, you had mentioned earlier, uh, cultures of trust, uh, yeah. right, and establishing yeah. trust and yeah. you know, really establishing trust in metaverse spaces is new. I mean, for gamers and really experienced, like I've been in MMOs for 20 years and yeah. got married through it, like those people are a lot further ahead of us yes. than, than what we're at right now. And like, figuring out how to love in the metaverse is mm -hmm. like, that, that's, that's a huge question. Or when you talk to kids who are like, yeah, that's my best friend. No, I've never met them. They're my best friend and, you know, what name a game. I mean, uh, you know, whatever game. There's trust. How, how do you even let that, how is that even possible? But it's an investment. That's the thing. And that's what I'm learning with the indigenous people's community. It's an investment. There is no, it's not about time. You don't jump in, have a best friend and leave. It's an investment over time. Mm -hmm. So hence the developer years, 24 years of this. So um, just do the math. I'll be <laughs> 77. <laughs> Amazing. Um, for me, I don't have too many other questions except um, we did cover you know, DAOs and we talked about um, uh, the culture coin token that's out there. I'm actually in the Discord and everything. And yeah. I don't have a chance to really engage yet, but uh, definitely... Uh, Definitely want to be a part of that from the ground up. Um, but, well, uh, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to his one thing on that, well, Todd. Um, so I have been part from the beginning and I volunteered to create the principles for that. And nice. my first step was to bring in, ironically, Burning Man principles and, a, I mean, and Amazon's 14 principles and bring them as a baseline to say, where are we similar and where are we different? And how do we begin to think that what we don't even know yet? but let's put something down. Is anybody following it? I have no idea. So now you're joining, you tell me if it shows up and if you have that experience, because I, I can't tell. Yeah, I'll let you know. Um, I'm just gonna start digging into it uh, after this probably. Uh, yeah. It's now uh, rekindling something that I should have done earlier, but this with other things in life. But um, Joe, are you uh, familiar with any like DAOs that you're, you're actually engaged with or anything that's interesting at top of mind? Oh, no, nah, I can't help you too much there. I had, I'm pretty heads down on building a new network these days. Yeah. I guess, uh, final thing with you, Joe, like you're working with UCSD right now with their new uh, uh, center. Anything uh, they can speak of with that work? Uh, sure. That's the new design and innovation building that's opening in November on UCSD campus. Um, so UCSD and the Arthur C. Clarke Center and all over campus and actually all over down here in San Diego and Tijuana, there's a network of uh, institutions, operators, companies, uh, schools of all sor sorts that are working together to put together um, a metaverse program regionally uh, that we're cooperating with and our showcase and our kind of access points to that floor is on the on the metaverse right now in alt space 
you know, hit me up. I'll give you a tour and bring, you can come to, to San Diego virtually and never have to set foot, but I do recommend it. It's beautiful here. Um, but we're helping them open that there and kind of create the thinnest point we can between the metaverse and reality so that the community can have access to the university from wherever they are in the world. Fantastic. Yeah, I can't wait to come down. We're doing an in-person hybrid event, right? In November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tribrid, tribrid, tribrid. Tribrid. I'm saying it's a tribrid. Our our event on November 5th is physically there will be people in the house. There will be people obviously watching on whatever platform. And then those of us in spatial IO and folks in Tilt Brush, there'll, there'll be multi-levels of ways to engage all in. And it's going to be interesting to see from everybody's perspective in that instance because it could be as rich being physically in the room as it is for somebody who's immersively in the room. Yeah, we've, uh, that's one of the, the fun parts with this uh, design and innovation building as well. The floor that we've got is, is a full uh, reflection at a mm -hmm. mirror, uh, not exactly a digital twin, more of a mirror, because all space is pretty limited, right? It's totally. Um, and, <clears throat> but it has that space, a little bit like you were doing with the house, right? Um, mm -hmm. How can you occupy that space and have, you know, the invisible people around you occupy that space with you at the same time mm -hmm. um, and, you know, share um, through the metaverse uh, an experience together? Right? Yeah, and also this art residency now understands, wow, we could always in an evergreen way, have immersive artists. And we will always have an artist in the house that takes up residency. So what does that mean? And that was completely not even on their radar. So it's interesting when you think of it that way, like it's opening up a whole new way of thinking. Yeah, we jumped ahead five years. Right, but, uh, exactly. terrible, A terrible bug made really fast things happen. But... Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Joe and Kathleen, for your time today. Uh, right now, we're at the point where we ask our audience, you know, <laughs> what topics should we be talking about next, next month? And uh, we put a list down and we vote on them, and then that's what we do next month. And so um, do you have any ideas of other topics we talk about where it's like an AI and insert topic? We're all ears right now. Um, the thing that comes to mind for me was uh, I was talking to a tattoo artist and a piercer about how he can't get around the world to do his training and what that looks like. And it made me think about persistent, persistent avatars, avatars that grow hair, avatars that have a pierce for a moment, it, you know, NFT experiences that you're selling with your avatar for a moment. All the things that we are, how I grow and evolve and expand behaviorally and self-actualized. Who is my avatar today and who's my avatar in five years? And you know, we're static right now. So the persistent world and persistent avatar perspective, I think is, that's where I'm sort of banking on is how we evolve in this space in real time. Um, I don't know if that's of interest to this group, but um, it might be too far out there. I think, uh, I think you should keep going far out man yeah, like, right. yeah, <laughs> I know, right. for real like i yeah. think like between our students for the last 10 years going back and forth whenever we bring students in or whenever we bring community in of, of not developers um they they ask us for ways to talk to trees the ways to mm -hmm. see the roots of of the mm -hmm. micro system mm -hmm. right and um i'm real curious into how ai and especially like uh, art created by AI, like humans have a hard time understanding natural systems. AI can help us bridge and machine learning can help us bridge understanding of natural systems and communicate with it. So in your avatar sense, like your avatar might, the, the, the avatars that aren't human, like mm -hmm. well, how is AI and going to drive the avatars that are inhuman in order for us to keep communicating with the planet that's around mm -hmm. us, right? Mm -hmm. In order for us to settle Mars, right? Mm -hmm. I, I also like, um, Todd, uh, what Nick Marks is up to with super reality and uh, what he's doing where everything outside in the world has an intelligence and how we absorb that as students of life. And, you know, where, again, Who's programming that? And is every AI engineer sitting next to behavioral psychologist as we program that? Or is it just a reflection of that person's own code and how they think?
All right, we've got some options here. Um, let me throw up a <coughs> survey. Can I do that? Oh, Paul, here we go. So I can do this. Nice. Did you watch Dune yet, Kathleen? No, it's on my list. <laughs> I, was thinking, I thought I thought we watched it uh, just this weekend, of course, because it came out. But I was yeah. heading into this discussion. I thought it was fascinating because it's yeah. a it's a world build that is rejecting yeah. AI, rejects machine interface. Mm -hmm. Like it it prefers a human world, and it's just a. And it was just an interesting juxtaposition to see yeah. like an envisionment of a 10,000 year history where humans pushed against AI versus where we're at now. So is this like a newly defined library of Alexandria? Like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> when we look, look back at that. I don't know, I, I gotta say, I feel so blessed to be living right now. It's crazy, it's crazy town to say when everyone's like, it's Armageddon, it's, it's headed to the worst. We're all, you know, we're all at, a, at the end. And I'm like, this is just the beginning. I, I, it's so exciting. I just want to see how this plays out. It does have that renaissance -y sort of feel to it. You may have had a plague right before that too. Okay. Yeah, right? It works exactly. out. Exactly. exactly. Terrible <laughs> stories give rise to amazing things. Yes, we're in such an economy, a creative economy right now. I just, it's phenomenal, it's phenomenal. Yeah, and the, and the, Oh, there we go. I'm not, I can, can we vote on this? Do we tilt your yeah. votes? Everyone can, uh, can vote. No, they're, they're all good. Is it one, pick one, pick one? Yes. Oh. Keep on going. We're almost there, 17 to 22. Come on, five more people. All right, keep it going. All right, almost there. Creativity is at 32% right now. All right, I think we can just hold right now. So yeah, um, it's gonna be AI and the creativity. Ooh, but what AI and emotions just came up and that's a good uh, one. <laughs> I think we should stick with AI and I the death industry. Probably should have brought that one back up. Yeah, right. Retirement. AI and retirement, that's a good one too. That's a good one. Yeah, it's uh, it comes up a lot in the funeral business. It's, it's definitely uh, interesting. All right, well, you guys can see the results now. Yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with creativity. And there's a lot yeah. there. <laughs> lots but, lots but, to cover in that one. I, I, I like, yeah, I, I do like that. And I do like emotions and retirement. Boy, they're all good. 